Okay, I think we're at 1600 UTC, so we'll get started. Um, thanks everyone who's uh, logged in and uh, registered and here. Um, my name is Ali Sayed. I'm a pediatric radiologist at uh, Stanford University, and I'm very happy to um, be here for the uh, pediatric MRI safety webinar that we're hosting, part two. Um, as some of you may know, this is the second webinar in the series uh, between the World Federation of Pediatric Imaging and the ISMRM, uh, focusing particularly on MRI safety and considerations for pediatric patients specifically when we come to MRI safety. Um, we have a great panel uh, of speakers lined up for you today. Um, <clears throat> and so we're just going to go ahead and, and jump right in. Just the format briefly is we have four speakers. Each speaker will have a, a, a 20 minute presentation and then we'll have a 10 minute Q&A afterwards. Um, and uh, if you think of questions during the presentation or as they're coming, feel free to write them into the chat. Um, and myself and uh, Claudia Lazarte, who's um, my co-moderator here, will be keeping an eye on the chat and uh, then we'll we'll address those questions during the Q&A. So, with that, let's jump into the first speaker. Um, the first speaker that we have today is Dr. Uh, Kish Mankad. He's a consultant pediatric neuroradiologist and the clinical lead for pediatric neuroradiology at Great Ormond Street Hospital in the UK. And he also holds an associate professorship with the Great Ormond Street UCL Institute of Child Health. He's passionate about quality and safety improvement. And today he'll be presenting his talk titled Safety Issues Relating to Medical Equipment and Medical Personnel. Thank you so much, Dr. Mankad. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, ISMRM and the World Federation of Pediatric Imaging. In particular, thank you to my friend Camilo for getting me involved. This being season two of the MR safety um, spectra that we are kind of dealing with, I'm going to talk a little bit about equipment and personnel. And I hope that this also buttresses the teaching and learning that you all have had so far with the previous speakers. And given the limited overlap that is expected in these topics, I think it's only going to be good revision for everyone to look at some key concepts and how it affects our day-to-day -day living, particularly when it comes to medical professionals involved in the care of patients in the MRI setting, as well as the medical equipment, uh, bizarre kind of trolleys that kind of float around the MR area and how to kind of make sense of what goes on out there. So uh, I'm very happy to be interrupted and take questions, but at the outset, I would like to acknowledge the following people for this presentation. And the whole reason to put this slide here is to show that this is a very multidisciplinary approach to safety. I don't think any one person is responsible for everyone else in the department. Safety is a shared responsibility and setting profiles for safety as well as standard operating procedures should be a team effort and there should be a better buy-in with regular audits and governance in place to ensure that we are up to date, we are aware of what's changing around us, and the fact that the whole department of the unit is situationally aware to everything that's happening in allied specialties for which we support with our imaging tools that are available to us. So thank you very much to everyone who's named here. The first concept that needs to be understood is the fact that the magnet is always on. And I think you might have come across this statement uh, quite a few times uh, through the course of learning about MRI safety. And let's kind of open up that magnet a little bit and see what exactly are the sources of risks that one can encounter when we look at the MR scan. So the first thing is the static magnetic field. And that is kind of by the pre sheer presence of the scanner in itself, whether it is a three Tesla, or a 1.5 Tesla or a lower or a higher strength scanner. And in terms of uh, measurements on Gaussian measures, each Tesla gives you 10,000 Gauss. So that's kind of the intensity of magnetic field that we are talking about. And uh, this entire case has basically uh, got liquid helium trying to cool it down on an ongoing basis. And that helium is best kept in a liquid state as much as possible. We we'll talk about quenching towards the end in terms of safety profiling and risk management and firefighting, so to say. And then uh, what happens is the RF field, which is a bit of a dynamic kind of arrangement uh, that comes from the various uh, coils, et cetera, that we have to put. And eventually we have these switched magnetic gradients 
which are also dynamic principles. So there is a static field, which has its own intensity, depending on the strength of the scanner. And then we have the dynamic aspects in terms of what coils, where we send to the patient in terms of the best imaging quality, and uh, as well as the switching of the magnetic gradients that create a further kind of magnetic fields floating around in that environment. And the environment is interesting to understand. We'll look at that in a moment. But if you think about static and uh, radio frequency fields, uh, it's important to understand what the instant effects on any uh, medical devices might be. First of all, there is the attractive force where there is a tendency of the object to move to the isocenter as in the middle of the scanner, so to say. And then there is the element of torque, which is where these objects would tend to line up with field lines. And remember that it is almost like a missile that objects can fly into the scanner and it is an exponential increase in speed as it gets closer and closer to the scanner, which is unstoppable beyond the point. And there is the attractive force as well as the torque that kind of uh, causes all the damage that it does when it comes to something that has been placed in the wrong area. And then we have the effects of radio frequency field, uh, particularly burns and thermal heating. And whilst we don't encounter that in the context of personnel looking after patients, but every time a device is connected to a patient per se, I think we're talking about medical equipment here for monitoring, et cetera, it becomes relevant to understand that these entities can be encountered, whether it be ECG leads or oxygen sats probe put on fingers or even burns from the coils itself. So there is the element of uh, the radio frequency pulses leading to heating and heating can be a problem as encountered in some instances. And these are never events if you look at the spectrum of possibilities. When they are encountered, they should be reported, discussed with a formal root cause analysis that should be done for all of these events at the local hospital. The next key concept is just going back essentially to the periodic table and beyond, looking at these various elements and trying to understand what the relative risks are and uh, the whole idea of diamagnetic, paramagnetic and ferromagnetic substances comes into play here. And uh, within that spectrum, we have the weakly to very strongly ferromagnetic substances. So magnetic susceptibility can be measured and I would like to bring your attention to things like titanium, which we know are relatively safe from a perspective of scanning. They are paramagnetic. And out here, we also have elements like stainless steel, which you might think as a ferromagnetic substance, but essentially is quite weakly ferromagnetic. And we are able to have implants and devices with stainless steel scanned rather safely as, as indicated or as might be the case. Of course, towards the end of the spectrum, we have pure iron, and towards the other end, we have uh, silver and other rare elements like gold. Of course, I don't hope that we would be implanting gold into patients or creating medical devices out of that, but if we did, in a better world, life could be safer and richer. Here's a moment of reflection, and these are scenarios that were picked up from our own risk register at Great Ormond Street Hospital, and I'm sure the story is commonplace to other hospitals across the world as well. And I've just taken the excerpts in terms of what events happened. So I want to read them out, and I want you to reflect on what could have been done better, and obviously these are events that shouldn't have happened in the first place. So nurse took scissors into the scan room, and as a consequence of that, damage could have happened, but the neonate involved was saved by the incubator. So sometimes incubators can also save neonates. Injector pump taken too close to magnet. This was another instance. And injector pumps are notorious, as we all know that you know people forget. They don't really check the label or the reading below the label in terms of what the conditions are for use. And our good radiographer, Tina, who happened to be around, and this was documented, managed to wrestle it away from the bowl before it caused more damage. Then children have been scanned with coins inside their pockets. Uh, people don't really pat on a regular basis. We only ask questions and it's a, it's a principle of uh, trust. But sometimes we really need to check when we are dealing with little ones because they can collect things in their pockets as well. Scanner run with no water cooling and that could be quite disastrous because this particular patient came out sweating profusely and we thought he was having a cardiac arrest or something like that. It was just a question of a lot of heating in that environment. We also had firemen come over and they wanted to put out a fire and were about to enter the scanner room in their full glory, so to say. And uh, literally uh, they had to be stopped very harshly by whoever was present there. 
uh, and this was prevented, the firemen did not all get stuck to the scanner. It would be quite an interesting picture to take. But this is a, not a comprehensive list. And in fact, there is a lot of under-reporting in terms of the near misses that happen on a day-to-day -day basis in the scanner environment, uh, both dealing with personnel as well as medical devices and equipment. So it's important to make sure that these are registered, reviewed, and uh, hopefully they don't recur. A few terminologies to uh, bring back to discussion here and labels that go with it. So when we look at medical uh, devices and equipment, you're looking for these symbols. You can have a green box with white writing or a white box with green writing, both of them implying MR safe. Now, MR safe as a definition has undergone a lot of metamorphosis in recent times, and we'll be looking at what MR safe means in the next slide. And then we have the uh, triangle with the yellow color inside and MR written on it. And this is the most important sticker you're looking for, MR conditional. Remember the term which is used by radiologists quite commonly is MR compatibility. Actually, that term is a misnomer. It means nothing. You're using MR safe, MR conditional, or MR unsafe from now on to explain and understand or to even discuss with people around as to what you're trying to imply. And MR safe, unsafe is a nice red danger kind of sign with MR written there. And it essentially means you know, not to be used at all. And beyond all that, there is the MR environment. And we will look at the MR environment when I try to tell you what the MR environment implies. So MR safe, MR conditional, and MR unsafe. And there is no terminology that we would be using called MR compatible when it comes to uh, medical uh, equipment as well as medical personnel. So what is MR safe? MR safe is an item that poses no known hazards in all MR environments. And as per latest definitions, really you're only looking at plastic, wood, and you can't assume MR safety just by holding something that looks like it's made of gold, silver, or aluminum, because there could be contaminants and most of these metals are hybrid metals anyways. So we're looking at a non-conducting, non-metallic, non-magnetic item, and of which only few options really would qualify instantly for being MRI safe. So watch it out. People might call fire extinguishers as MR safe, but they may not ever be. MRI conditional is an item that has been demonstrated to pose no known hazards in a specified MR environment with specified conditions of use. The specified environment would be a 1.5 or 3 Tesla or 7 or less. And uh, the specified conditions could be numerous. And this is generally put under the label that you would find the triangle with the yellow color inside, which means MRI conditional. Some good people would actually put a label there as MRI conditional. And then you have to read for those specified environments and conditions where it can be used. So being MRI conditional is a relative state. It doesn't apply to all environments and all conditions. It is specific for the particular equipment that we are trying to use, including fire extinguishers or oxygen cylinders. Well, the oxygen cylinders are interesting. They should be nowhere near a scanner, but anything else that one might be wanting to use, including syringe drivers or even monitoring devices of other nature. And these symbols are very important to look out for, either the green box, the yellow triangle, or the red cross. Now, this is a picture of our Pretty ancient now 1.5 uh, Tesla scanner, one of those scanners in the hospital. And I wanted to show this to you. I want you to look at the contour lines. The last time you looked at contour maps was probably uh, in geography uh, in school, if you did geography. And you might remember that these contour lines can get quite concentrated towards the middle of the action point and then kind of disperse out as you go. So it's kind of a geographical description of what is happening to the intensity of magnetic fields here. And these are the measures of that, whether you do it in MT, which is micro Teslas, or you can do it in Gauss. But essentially, uh, there is a concentration of these values. And then as we move towards the door of the room or away from the scanner, these values will drop. And at some point in time, you would reach a five Gauss distribution, which is the red circle here. And five Gauss or 0.5 MT is essentially referred to as the uh, higher limits of the MRI environment. So it's a three-dimensional volume of space surrounding the MR magnet that contains both the Faraday uh, shielded volume and the 0.5 MT or the five Gauss line. And this volume is a region in which an item may 
and might possess a poser hazard from exposure to electromagnetic fields, which can be produced by the MR equipment or its accessories. And beyond that, we are relatively safe. So it's interesting that the uh, MR environment of this particular scanner in this old hospital unit where it was placed was getting into the admin offices. We still use it as an admin office and to the equipment room as well. So we do have three admin people sitting there at the moment. And when you get into their office from the door, you will see that there is a bit of a line of control that has been put there as a barrier, essentially a sticker like a police line that you can't cross. And for a while, I used to wonder what that line was when I started in the hospital. I thought some crime had been committed there. Only later when I saw this picture did I realize that actually they, there was a little bit of magnetism happening. And the story goes that some of their filing cabinets, which were made of iron, got magnetized over the years and people did not realize it for a while. So it's important to know what the limits of uh, the intensity are. And after the five Gauss line, you are relatively safe wherever you are, but there is always the element of uh, magnetism around. As such, we know magnetism is all around us. The Earth's field has got magnetism, magnetism to it as well. So that is your MRI environment. Now, this is a picture from uh, our own hospital here, uh, a few different kind of equipments which are MR conditional. So we are not using the word MR compatible anymore. And these are listed out and completely displayed for on, on every scanner room in terms of their maximum magnetic field, which is the fringe effect. So really, for instance, if you have a MedRad power injector and it says 2000 Gauss, which is all determined by measuring on a regular basis with a magnetometer, pretty much you stand there and use a magnetometer and see where it is safe and unsafe you would put it at a distance of at least 2000 Gauss from the scanner. Anything closer, it might gain a lot of escape velocity and go to the wrong places. Uh, of course, manufacturers try hard to show their MR safety. And you can see these values may have come from manufacturers as well. So on a pre-Tesla scanner, a Gallops patient trolleys has a maximum magnetic field of 30,000 Gauss, which is pretty safe. But even then, I think local checks need to be initiated with your MR technologies in terms of ensuring that it works for your department and your setup. These two pictures given by Professor Michael Keane, who is my favorite MR technologist in Melbourne, shows a practice in another children's hospital. So they have the red line to show the five gauze, which is the MRI environment limits for them. And then they have a black line, which is 250 Gauss. We generally at Great Ormond Street would put a black interrupted line at 30 Gauss, which is a fair cutoff in terms of safety. And generally MR conditional equipment really should not cross these lines unless really you can assess the safety risk as required. So it's, a, it's an aspirational target uh, to have these lines in place and to understand what these lines mean as you get started in your respective hospitals. So here's a bit of an interactive mode and uh, let me know what you think about this particular picture and how many of these different uh, syringe drivers are MR compatible. And I can tell you uh, for want of time, there is only one that really would qualify. Uh, it's not about looking at it instantly and deciding whether it looks uh, of plastic or other make, you have to look out for the label which would be stuck in the back of this. But everything else you can see is more complex got metallic elements to it. So not all these are really safe. And as a corollary, you have monitoring devices here and you can decide which ones you think might be safe. So take a moment to do that. At the moment you're looking for in real time, in real world practice, you'll be looking at triangles or squares or circles, depending on their safety profiling. But just to give you a snapshot, not everything that we are using to monitor patients is actually uh, MR conditional or even relatively speaking, MRI safe, unless it is tested and labeled as such. So do not use non-MR monitoring, only use dedicated equipment, which is scheduled to be used in MR and do not mix and match monitoring cables. That's a problem we encounter a lot. Uh, when the cables are mixed up, it's hard to know which is and which is not. And of course, uh, the local MRI guidelines, which need to be updated on a regular basis need to be followed. Otherwise it's quite a heterogeneous environment and it's quite unsafe. So remember the magnet is always on when you're trying to get it done. A word about the conditional uh, IV syringe drivers. 
And the most important message here is that they are complex and they can get very complex depending on how sick the patient is. But the MR team is the gatekeeper and not the follower. So don't expect your anesthetists or the medical team or the intensive care team to decide how safe it is to get something in. You, as the MR team, whether you're a radiographer, a tech, or a radiologist, you have to decide, and your decision matrix is enabled by local practice, as well as correct labeling, which is ensured there to check on a regular basis before you advise anyone coming in with any of these monitors. Otherwise, things can go wrong. And in fact, in spite of being in a Faraday cage that these pump drivers are sometimes transported in, it doesn't make them completely safe. So you have to be mindful of the fact that just because it's in a cage doesn't mean that you know catastrophic events cannot happen. And this happened uh, in a particular instance where the um, device was being transported in a Faraday cage and yet managed to find its way to the wrong place. Radio frequency energy we talked about, and we talked about heating uh, relating to specific absorption rate and the possibility of burns. But not only does it cause surface burns, you can have a problem with uh, burns even to devices and implants in the brain. This is a case report of a deep brain stimulation device gone wrong. Quite an interesting case report published of many years ago now. And you can see that the area of burn inside the brain was quite a large area. You can see the contralateral implant actually looks how it should look. And this patient was clinically quite unwell with abnormal neurology after having undergone an MRI scan. So things uh, that we should be mindful of. And luckily, you know, we don't see a lot of that on a regular basis, but the number of implants and devices are going up exponentially. Let's shift a little bit of gear towards the uh, staffing uh, profile and the personnel that work in these areas and two different checklists. One is from our own hospital. It's a bit more basic, but I think that box is interesting, including Oyster cards. If you're a London commuter, for instance, can actually get demagnetized credit cards, scissors, and all sorts of things that people like carrying in their pockets. And a usual kind of checklist, which every staff is expected to at least sign once. The practice in Melbourne down under is more interesting. They have a lock your belongings, empty your belongings on the desk, sweep. This is interesting. I don't know how many of you do it in your hospitals. One of the MRI team members will sweep the ferromagnetic detector over you like an, an airport setting. This will occur once per list. You will be asked to confirm if you have completed the MR safety training and questionnaire. That's quite interesting. We are not sweeping uh, out in London, but it might be a uh, double measure for safety. And then tape your pockets close. That is also quite unique to practice. And then pat your pockets to ensure they're empty. This must be observed by an MRI team member every time you enter the MRI room. So I think pretty good practices if they are following them, the sweeping, the sealing, the patting, which I don't think all hospitals are doing. So I thought the Royal Children scored a little higher compared to us when I was looking at their staff safety screening on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm sure all hospitals out there listening in have something similar anyways. But what is more important is really how we get to work. I mean, you know, we come to work in bicycles, quite a clutter on these tables, uh, various kinds of devices, including stethoscopes, which for radiologists are, you know, like unicorns essentially, but sometimes some very ancient things are lying around. And this is a crash trolley on which it is lying. So to say the crash trolley in itself is not MR compatible. So what items are required to be stored in locker and what items are permitted in MRI? We're talking about anywhere near the MRI environment, not directly into the scanner, but uh, you know everything that you're not sure about should be checked with your MR technologist for sure, including the specific devices for diabetes care and things like that. So whilst it is important to be uh, safe and healthy yourself, it's important to think about the environment around you. Some key concepts, if things go wrong and you know things have got stuck into the scanner or things are moving around violently, flying around in the room because somebody decided to get a pair of scissors, for instance, which was not made of gold, then um, we need to be able to identify these buttons. And those who are, of you who have practiced in MR environments would know these buttons quite well. We are a Siemens site. I'm not trying to sell Siemens to you. There was no disclosure. It's just that most of our pictures will have the branding, but you can have all companies showing similar things. If you have an inverted magnet with a cross, this is your quench button. This is not your stop the scanner button. The stop the scanner button, the emergency stops are pretty much standard red circles or triangles. But anywhere you look at uh, this inverted uh, magnet, 
uh, like a horseshoe thing will cross, it's a quench. Now, when would you quench? When would you not quench? These are some questions for you to reflect. A piece of equipment stuck inside the magnet without a patient, we don't quench. And the cost of quenching, the problem with quenching is significant. We know that. And it takes a scanner down for weeks together. But if a piece of equipment is stuck with a person pinned to that, like happened in Mumbai recently, for instance, where the person carrying the oxygen cylinder died inside the scanner and it was an endangering life, yes, you would go ahead and quench it. But, you know, human nature, we have a low threshold to go and press all these buttons instantly when we think something minor is going on. In fact, even if you have a small fire in a magnet room that can be put out with an extinguisher, you would not quench the scanner. You would not quench the scanner um, that the fire service can fight from the MRI scan room door, but make sure the fire service doesn't enter and it's full glory into the scan room. And eventually, uh, yes, you would quench it if this is a severe fire. So try to maintain your calm and cool because things do happen. Little fires can happen. Doesn't mean on every opportunity you forget to get, get to press that quench button. Uh, that can be quite deleterious in itself to your practices. If there is a crash call, for whatever reason, please don't push the crash trolley into the scanner room. The crash trolleys universally are not MRI compatible, or at least the things they contain within them will never be MRI compatible. So please make sure that you don't take the crash trolley into the scanner. Get the patient out to a safe environment. That is the first step. Unfortunately, we have to make them safe in a different environment before the crash team can do their best to revive the patient. So even if they're having a contrast reaction, Stop the scanner if you have to, don't quench it, get them out, and uh, then get the crash team involved. So uh, as I complete this uh, 20, 25 minutes of talk, a little bit of quiz in the end, which one of these items can you take into the scan room? And whilst we are looking at these various items, uh, I don't think you can actually use the chat function, but uh, essentially uh, there are only two options here that would be working for you, the C and D options. Otherwise, things can really go wrong as this representation shows out here. Final slide, um, there is a lot of information out there, and uh, this is a slide given to me by Michael Keane. Lots of MR safety procedure posters out there on the ISMIM website, so make sure you can get some of these out and paste it on the wall if you're trying to teach people and use the information that is freely available. Thank you very much for your information and your time, and stay safe. Thanks a lot. Kish really was an excellent presentation. Really, we need to be aware of safety issues relating to medical equipment and medical personnel. So, um, but I don't have questions in the chat, but uh, I really, we really need to be aware of this uh, topic because um, we need to maintain safe the MRI area just to avoid this kind of accidents, right? So I have, um, just to, I have a question. How do you manage uh, when you have a patient with fever? Um, but they really need an MRI scan. Do you put some like medicine just to decrease the fever and then keep the patient inside? What do you recommend uh, to the doctors in these cases? Because they always are insisting and please, we need the MRI and the patient is uh, the patient has fever. So how do you manage that? So we do advise our clinicians to try and manage the uh, febrile state as much as possible before they get scanned. As such, the dictum still is if the patient is not safe, with whatever reason, if they're really unwell encephalopathic with a lot of high temperatures and all that could be brought down with antipyretics. But otherwise, we don't give them any specific medications in the scanner room as such uh, to bring that temperature down. We try to minimize our protocols as much as possible. Okay. Uh, that's, okay. That's the best we do. Okay, perfect. And um, so just to tell you, we did, have, uh, we did have a quench in my hospital like a lot of years ago. And it was due to the, um, we just started doing MRIs here and the engineers didn't uh, check very well about the, the, the alio in the MRI scan. And well, at the end we did have a quench. And so also it's important not just to be, to involve, I mean, technologists and nurses as well. We need to involve the engineer uh, engineers in this, in the, in the care of the MRI machine, because it's really important to, to check is like uh, to have a protocol just to check that every point is running well before to start an MRI, an MRI scan. So um, again, thanks a lot uh, for your presentation. Was 
Excellent. So let's continue because we are on time with Philippa Breeden. Please, Ali, can you introduce Philippa? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. So our next speaker will be uh, Philippa Bridgen, uh, who is an advanced MRI research radiographer at King's College London in the UK and has extensive experience in MRI safety, including in children. Um, she also has particular unique experience even in high field MRI and clinical use all the way up to 70. Um, but today she'll be speaking about safety in the MRI environment, uh, screening and safety zones. So please take it away, Philippa. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, a great talk, Kish. I know there's going to be a little bit of an overlap here in between our talks, um, but, you know, repetition is always good as well. Um, so today, um, just to introduce myself for those who don't know me, my name is Philippa Bridgen. Um, I work for King's College London and I'm the lead research radiographer um, in the 70 and the advanced in MRI unit. Um, we're actually based at um, Bison St. Thomas's as well. Um, so just going to go through the aims. There are quite a lot of aims here and I will kind of just brush over these quickly because you'll see them all later on the tour but I'm going to talk about the guidelines um, also MR systems the MR environment and the MR controlled access area operating modes and also MR personnel um, MR safety markings and coils screening pediatric considerations acoustic noise and um, patient prep and also GAs so there's lots in there Okay, so just a bit of a disclaimer, I work in the UK, and I understand that we have lots of guidelines, and but we do all have different, slightly different guidelines to what you have over in the US, so I'm going to try and cater it for both sides of the pond as well, so that because I know there are some differences there, but as I said, I work in the UK, so our main governing guideline that we have is from the MHRA, and then we also have at the IEC, which is an international standard, which I know does go across the pond over to the US as well, and um, so we also have localised um, guidelines as well. So we have the local rules, which uh, basically governs the whole of the department. Um, and it's our local rules within our hospital. And I know you'd have those at each of your departments. And that should have general information in there, rules for the workers within the MR unit, and also additional rules for the authorised supervisors. But we also have one step further in our um, trust as well, that we have local rule supplements. And these are specific to each scanner. And so each scanner will have their own supplement. And this gives a list of MR responsible persons and also processes specific to that scanner as well. And we're also very lucky where we are. We have a very large physics team, which works at Guys and St. Thomas's and also helps Kings out as well. Um, and so we have a departmental implant procedures as well, which are written by the physicists and are referenced. And so these will be specific guidelines set out for implants if they are recognised, say for example, clips and staples or orthopaedic implants. And it will give us that kind of information to whether that is safe to scan and how we can do that safely. And if it's not in that, uh, guidelines, it will set out a process for off-label risk assessments. But ultimately, uh, you know, we need to ask ourselves, are they safe to scan? And it's always okay to say, actually, no, they're not. So this has already gone through on Kish's talk, but I'm just going to recap it again. And um, so this is the MR system. We are all really aware of this, and this is just a slice through the scanner. And um, so we obviously got the magnet, the gradient coils, and the RF coils as well, and the patient's table. So a little bit about the static magnetic field. So this is the strength of the scanner, and commercial strengths are normally about 0.2 to 3 Tesla, but you can have different strengths at in research centres, which can either go below the 0.2 or above the 3T. So for example, in my centre, we're quite lucky in the fact that we have a 0.06 quart Tesla, a 0.55 Tesla, 1.5 Teslas, 3 Teslas, and also 7 Teslas. So there are potential biological effects that are created by the static magnetic field, and this can be vertigo as they're going into the scanner or when they're in the scanner, nausea, nausea, sorry, nausea, I can't see it today, uh, nystagmus, and also metallic taste as well. But the mechanical effects that you can also get from the static magnetic field can be projectiles. So this is a translational force where it's trying to get to the center of the ball or torque from rotational forces and lens forces as well. The gradients themselves um, can turn on or off really, really quickly, which adjusts the magnetic field and um, which gives, allows you to have spatial encoding. But this fast switching also causes lots of acoustic noise and it can take it above safe levels. So it's also being aware of that. So the potential biological effects created by the gradient cause can be peripheral nerve stimulation or PNS, which is quite often referred to, or acoustic noise, which can also cause hearing damage as well. The radio frequency coils um, are the most inner part of the scanner, and these can create thermal heating and can cause 
current burns or contact burns. And as all the frequencies that are given from the RF can be deposited as energy within the tissues. So what we say is that an acceptable rise in temperature in the tissues is one degree, but anything above that is not acceptable. And we have to be mindful of this because we obviously don't want to burn or overheat our patients. But there are other factors that can also affect this. So we also need to be mindful of that. So that might be the ambient temperature of the room, the airflow going over the patient or the clothing that they're wearing. Is it a man-made fiber or is it a natural fibers? Like is it cotton? And also humidity within the scanner as well. So the MR environment, this is mainly for the UK. So the MR environment and the MR controlled access area is how we define it in the UK. So this is the um, definition of the MR environment, which is mentioned by the MA MRHA. Uh, so it's a three dimensional volume of space surrounding the MR magnet, which includes the five Gauss line and also the volume region in which might pose a hazardous to exposure for electromagnetic fields produced by the MR equipment and accessories. So what does that mean? So essentially the MR environment is the space in the scanner room where it also includes the five Gauss line, which can be seen in a dotted line around the scanner. So you've got the scanner here. So we're talking about this orange area here and all the patients and patients, participants, staff, anyone who's entering that should have an MR screening, safety screening done prior to entering that area. So the other area that we define it within the UK is the MR controlled access area. So this is the line within the red dot line around it outside, and this includes and houses the MR environment. So it should be big enough to house that. And it is also access controlled. So only authorized persons can actually enter that area. And there should be suitable signage that you're actually entering the MR controlled area as well. So for my colleagues across the pond, um, so you defined your areas as zones. So we have zone one here, which is just that there, which is all areas are freely accessible to the public. Then we have zone two, which is classed as the areas between zone one and three, where the patients or participants are under general supervision. So that might be the reception, changing room, MR screening rooms. And then we have zone three, which is the MR controlled room or the MR controlled access area here, where staff and patient must have completed an MR safety and be cleared in order to enter. And then we have zone four, which is the magnet room, which houses your five gauss spine and also your MR scanner. Um, and it should only be accessible through zone three, so you can only get to it through the control room. So a little bit about the static magnetic field. So as we know, the static magnetic field is the strength at the isocenter of the school, the isocenter of the ball, sorry. So if you can see from this diagram down here, it shows you how that increases in order to get up to the isocenter of the ball. So this is our one from the 70. So this is a quarter of your scanner. So you imagine this is your table down here and this is the ball here. So it goes up quite quickly in concession. You must know that the five Gauss line will be different for each scanner and the distance it will be from the ball. So you shouldn't really know where that is and that should be measured. And it will be different in every scanner. So you should be able to get your physics team to be able to measure that for you. So a nice example of that is our 70 here. So our control room is actually part of the MR environment because this red line here where the line change is actually where our five Gauss line is and actually goes into the control room. So the main thing to take away from this is to know your scanner um, and also have that line marked down, know where that five gas is, and this will be as part of your acceptance testing of the scanner as well. So a little bit about the operating modes. We all work with them every day, but do we know really what they mean? So we've got the normal operating mode, so where none of the outputs have a value that will cause any physiological distress. So most of our scanning should be happening in normal operating mode. And then we have first level operating mode where one or more values may cause physiological distress and needs to be controlled by medical supervision. And it is down to your department to define what you define as medical supervision for that. And then there's one that not very many of us would use, hopefully, is the second level operating mode, which is in research only. And there should be ethics and also written confirmation from the manufacturers for you to be able to use this. And that is where one or more output that may cause significant risk to a participant. So it is recommended by the IEC and the MHRA to really make yourself familiar with the SAR limits of your systems, because this will be displayed in a different way, depending on which vendor you're using. So really do make sure that you know your scanner. So MR personnel. Um, so there are, by the MRHA um, and also the IEC defined um, into slightly separate areas. For this. So you will be fitting into one of these. So one of those is the MR safety expert. And this is someone who has a higher level than normal knowledge of physics. 
um, and MR physics in that. So that might be a physicist or someone who's really, really experienced. But you should know that they should not be the MR responsible person. So the MR responsible person is responsible for the day to day responsibility of the MR safety of that magnet. So I am personally um, MR responsible person on the 7T, one of the three T's on the 0.55. So I'm responsible for the day to day runnings of it and the safety running of it and also making sure that the training's done for that. Then you have authorised persons and at least by can be then split down into three more so you've got the authorised person which is a supervisor and um, which is the can have access to the MR environment and the MR controlled area and they are able to supervise others so they're able to take responsibility for themselves and other people you have authorised persons which are for the MR environment which have access to the MR environment and the controlled area but they cannot supervise anyone else so they're only responsible for themselves and then you have authorised persons who are non-MR environments. So these have free access to the MR controlled area, but they need supervision from a supervisor to enter the MR environment because a supervisor can take responsibility and supervise others. And then on that top of that, you have MR operators. So that could be an MR authorised supervisor who have the ability and the knowledge in order to operate that machine. So a little bit about the safety marking. So anything that's within the MR unit should be labelled. And there is a fourth category to this, which is unlabeled. So you'd hope that it, wouldn't, it would stay unlabeled for a very short amount of time and it would become labelled. So we have the MR safe, which has no known hazard in the MR environment. And this is composed of non-conductive, non-metallic, and non-magnetic material. You have MR conditional, and it's really important that we say conditional, not compatible. So compatible is what it used to be referred to, but it's now conditional because they have conditions that have to be defined to be in the MR environment. So these conditions may be the strength of the scanner, the SAR limit, so that it may be talking about the head, total head SAR or the whole body SAR that you can't actually go over, the gradient systems that are used or the gradient slew rates or how close to the ball that that can go, so at what millitesla line that can go up to, say for example a GA MR conditional GA equipment or MR conditional monitoring. And then we also have a third category, which is the MR unsafe. So this poses an unacceptable, unacceptable risk to patients, medical staff, or other persons within the MR environment. And this should not, under any circumstances, be entering the MR environment, as it has the risk of becoming a projectile. So on top of this, so you've got all of that, you now need to know, make sure that you know your coils. Do you know the coils that you are using? Are they transmit receive coils? Are they receive only coils? Does your scanner that you're using have a body coil? So most scanners do, but say for example, the 70, it doesn't have a transmit coil within the actual scanner. So all of our scanners are transmit receive. Do your coils have CE or FDA approval? Are they made in house or have they been made by a manufacturer? Do you know what you can, you cannot scan with that coil? So look at the label look for CE marking. So here I've got a display of one of our uh, coils labels as an example. Um, and this is a, one of our scanners uh, on coils on the 7T. So you can see that it's got its CE marking and also it is one transmit 32 receive and it's a head coil at 7T. And this will also have the serial number on there. It will also have, you know, who made it and what can be scanned on it. Do you know the number of channels that you're using within your coil? And this also is another label down here that we have on one of our coils, which shows that actually this coil, which is a flex coil, can be used on the body, but it can't be used on the head. So it's just making sure that all your staff are familiar with the coils that they're using. It should also be noted that if you have a coil on a patient and it is not plugged in when it's inside the bore, it will not allow it to detune. So this can lead to patient burns and damage to the coil. So if you have a coil on a patient and it's not being used, take it off. If you have a coil on the patient and you want to use it, then it needs to be plugged in as well. You won't get any pictures as well. MR screening. So this is, you know, part of our everyday life. Anyone who works in MR should be very familiar with this, um, but it should be done with all participants regardless of age. So for our neonates, we have a separate um, MR safety form. And this is split into two parts. So the page one, so this page here is gone through with the parents. So to the best of their ability, they can give us the name of the child, the date of birth, address, and also gives them that they have understanding and answered all the questions correctly. And then we have another section that goes through with the staff, the radiographer, and or the nurse or the doctor who's basically looking after that child during the scan. 
just to ensure that we have really fully prepared that patient for the scan. So we're looking, do they have vascular lines? Oh, have they got PDA clips? Do they have scalp clips? You know, have they got endotracheal tubes? Have they got a ward pulse ox? Has that been taken off? Have they got clothes with metal poppers? Or have they got hearing aids, religious artifacts? Has hearing protection been applied left and right? And then this is signed by the clinician who's looking after the child, but also the MR authorised person who is going through that form with them, which should be an MR authorised supervisor. We also have another form which is for children under 16 and we do tend to go through this with a child and the guardian present and um, this is and then we ask the guardians for under 16s because in the UK anyone under the age of 16 is considered to be a child and anyone over the age of 16 can sign for themselves unless they have a guardian and then we get them to sign this when they go through it. If we do kind of think that the kid or the child has not um, fully answered those questions or there's maybe something they're not completely telling us, we might quickly ask them again before they go in just to check there's nothing that we're missing. And this should also be done at the time of booking so that we can prepare for any implants. We can see actually, is it safe for us to scan them? And for medical devices in this issue, do we have an SAP in place already for that device? Do we have a systems of work for that? Is it for a clinical scan or is it for a research scan? If it's for a clinical scan and the conditions can be met, then we will go ahead and scan. But if not, then maybe off-label risk assessment needs to be carried out. And that isn't justified for a research scan. And also to make sure that you have consultation with your in-house physics team. And But ultimately, the question is, are they safe to scan? Yes or no? And it is OK to say no. So paediatric considerations, there are many that we need to consider. And I'm sure you're all aware of these because you all scan paediatrics, but we're just going to go quickly through those. So they are smaller, so they can hit the SAR limits earlier, just because they are genuinely smaller in size. They can't communicate as well. So do we have monitoring on that patient if they aren't able to communicate? Say, for example, neonates, have they had a raise in their heart rate and a slight drop in their SATs so that we can kind of see what's going on? Are you able to distract them if they are old enough to go in so you don't have to go down the route of a GA? We are quite lucky that we have a projector and we have a screen so they can watch TV while they're in the scan to try and distract them. And also children do have a lower tolerance to acoustic noise. And because they're more sensitive to loud noises and they are a, you know, considered to be an at-risk group, we need to kind of make sure that we pay attention to that really importantly. Um, and also because they're very small, they can't regulate their temperature as well. So we also record all the temperatures on our neonates and also our very, very small children as well. But just also be mindful as well that there may be differences with MR safety in the right fact that they may have slightly different devices that you may not have come across routinely in adults, say, for example, growth plate simulators. And also pacemakers are quite often unsafe in an adult po paediatric population due to the placement of the leads and because they're implanted in different ways in order to limit heating within children. And if you're interested in this, there is a really, really good paper out here and there's the reference here of Michel et al, which is 22. So as I mentioned, acoustic noise um, is produced by the switching of the gradients and this happens quite quickly, which causes acoustic noise. Um, the ICN, IRP and the MHRA recommend the use of hearing protection for anything over 85 decibels, but we give it to everyone regardless. Um, so the paediatric, neonates and unconscious groups are a group of concern. And so we need to make sure we pay extra attention to this and hearing protection should be used. So depending on the size of the patient is depending on what we use. So if they are big enough to put earplugs in and we feel that they are confidently going to fit that participant, we will use earplugs. But for paediatrics who are quite small, we use ear putty. And um, so this is the brand that we use. So you mix them together and you kind of put them in. So the neonates, we put ear putty in and we also put earmuffs on top and then we have a little headband. And then we also use an acoustic hood as well, which also helps dampen the noise. But other things that you can think of alternatively might be about adapting the sequences parameters so you have slower gradients and you can reduce the maximum gradient amplitudes, which in turn will make them quieter. So patient prep is another really important thing we need to kind of think about when we kind of getting our patient ready and has your patient got changed? Have they removed all the jewellery? How is the patient positioned? Think loops. Do they have their hands touching or the sides or linked at the top or their knees or their feet? So there's a nice diagram here on the right hand side. This is part of our local rules, but I know this is a diagram that is quite popularly used. So you are probably all quite familiar with that. The other thing you need to think about is your cables from your coils. Are they running next to the patient? Are there loops in those cables? 
are they touching the patient? And if they are touching the patient, have you used foam pads in between the patient and that cable in order to insulate them so that you can give them um, that extra protection? And also, are their arms touching the side of the scanners? That's also another consideration we've got as well. So GAs, why? Why well, we use them quite often for younger children because they won't be able to tolerate the scan as well or older children who won't be able to tolerate the scan or who really do need like really detailed imaging and this can be quite useful for say for example DBF planning. Um, it's really um, good to make sure that the staff attending are familiar with the MR environment and if they're not and they are unfamiliar then how can we make them familiar? So make sure they're all screened and they've all given some extra training and are they aware of what they can and cannot do? Kish put it quite nicely and he described them as gate, you know, the MR team as gatekeepers. And I think that's quite a nice way to put it. It's also having that two-way conversation with the staff. And so they feel that they can ask questions, but also you can give them and guide them in the right way so that you can actually get what you need and you can do the GA and it can all be done safely. But GA offers its own risks and shouldn't be taken lightly. And you really do need to actually say, you know, is it necessary? Do we really need this scan? So you also need to make sure that you have MR conditional GA equipment and is that tested to the strength of your scanner that you're wanting to use and also MR conditional monitoring and it's really important that we actually use MR conditional monitoring we you know they don't try to use ward monitoring at all as well. So in conclusion uh, paediatrics can be scanned safely and um, special precautions should be taken training is really really important and it's good to go over these things again and again and again Please be mindful of MR safety um, and know your scanner and also know your coils. Um, I'd like to acknowledge these people and if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to contact them and also take them for this. Thanks a lot, Philippe, for your presentation. It really was very, very well done. I keep a lot of your uh, recommendations and um, what and what do you do with about implants? I mean, uh, for example, when the patient uh, come for an MRI scan, of course they feel a questionnaire about the implants that they can have. But what happened? Or do you uh, prefer that the patient or the physician or the attendee of the, this patient feel like a special paper or a questionnaire just and signing it? That this implant or device is compatible with MRI machine, or do you just a belief in the patient and with the questionnaire that they feel it's okay to get into this scan? Um, that's a great question. Um, so it is really dependent on what field strength that you're on. So as I said, I work on a seven Tesla as well as a look, look, all the strengths below. And um, so for our seven Tesla, for example, we say that there are no implants that it can be scanned on it. And that includes dental wires um, as well. Um, it is dependent mm -hmm. on what that implant is. I will always research that implant. If we have an SOP for that specific implant and that's been put in in the UK quite often, that can be a condition as part of our SOPs, then we will follow that. If mm -hmm. it isn't included in that risk assessment or that SOP, um, we actually contact our MR physics team and we give them the MR, exactly what the implant is and also the guidance for it. And if there isn't an SOP for that, then it might be the fact that we do an off-label risk assessment. So this really reiterates the strengths and the reasoning behind doing pre-screening mm -hmm. before having the patient come to the department. So you're able to prepare that as well. And we also have a very good working relationship with our physics team. So if we do need to have a, an adapt adaptation of the sequences, they do do that with us. And we have quite a good working relationship that goes both ways for that. But again, it ultimately it comes down to what strength scanner is, what is the implant? Do we have an SAP in place already? Um, and exactly. what is that? And what is it? You know, there's many things that, you know, you may th not think twice about scanning, say, for example, an ORIF on a 1.5, maybe, you know, it's there and it's, mm -hmm. out, of, it's out of the RF field. Um, so you might mm -hmm. be, but then there are some things like a pacemaker, say, for example, you'd be a lot more cautious about doing it. Okay. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, Philippe. Another question is, and uh, it's very important to, to, to be a, to, to have clear about the MRI zones. That's something that you really specify in your presentation. And just to be, uh, to take care of the children and also of the, the parents and the persons that are just walking around the MRI scan or MRI area, right? 
And also about the authorized person supervisor MRI in the MRI environment and non-MRI area also are, to me, were, uh, were very, very important things to keep in mind always when you work in an MRI uh, with an MRI machine. Um, and I have another question. Uh, I don't know Maria, how is oh, we are on time. Oh, Ali, do you have another question? Oh, I just, there's a, uh, one question that was put in the Q&A, maybe just in, in the uh, interest of time, I'll ask that one. But uh, Jamil, one of our attendees asked a question about, uh, can we do scanning of patients with tattoos, which I, is a, a question that often comes up in MRI, so. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so again, dependent on field strength. So at 70, we say that it has to be outside of the RF field. So we say by at least 30 centimeters. So if you were scanning a head, for example, if they had a tattoo on their foot, then we would still scan them. I think it is, they, there's limited, um, we still scan them where we would at our unit. And um, we just basically, if it's quite a large piece, we kind of say to them, you know, if it gets hot, then tell us, but we still would scan them. Um, I don't think there'd be a reason why we wouldn't scan them unless it was the 7T and it would be where the RF field would be going because they will transmit receive coils. Yeah. And what's what's your approach, if I can just ask a follow-up question, for, yeah, what's your absolutely. approach for patients uh, that are under general anesthesia? That's a sticking point that often comes up with us where, you know, we don't, we're in a state where the patient can't tell us if it's heating. How, how do you approach those? Tattoos when the patient's being anesthetized or maybe it is, you know, how, is unresponsive or has developmental delay for children or something like that so for ones who um so for patients who are under general anesthetic and um, we obviously we try to only do a general anesthetic if we really have to do it or if they're an itu patient um with respects to um heating for the younger children, we record their temperature. Um, when I worked at an adult unit, we wouldn't routinely record temperature, but we would also do SATs and also heart rate and BP if needed by the anaesthetic. And we'd be led by the anaesthetic to what monitoring they wanted. I think the key is with general anaesthetic is to not scan longer than you have to, get the information that you need and don't just run extra sequences for academic reasons. So, you know, really have that defined protocol and have that decided before you go in. Um, and also just kind of keep on monitoring. And if you are at all worried with that patient and because they aren't able to communicate with you, have a look at maybe recording their temperature as well as also BP and SATs and things like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And there's one, we have one other question uh, posted in the uh, Q&A, which is uh, what's the main reason a 70 doesn't have a uh, body transmit coil as a uh, transmit receive coil. Is it safety or is there a technical reason? Um, there's, I've had, had a long conversation about this with our engineer actually. So the wavelength in 70 is actually quite a lot shorter. So, you know, you need to have the transmit as close to the body part as you possibly can. Also with 70, because of the shorter wavelengths, you can have quite a lot of localized heating. So you want to try and make it as homogeneous as possible. So that's why we use transmit receive quite a lot with 70. Um, and also, I think it's just the way that they've designed it. And so they don't get so much B1 in homogeneity across the field. And um, so they haven't really found a way to be able to do the whole body coil and also get as much homogeneous as they possibly can. Because the whole game with 70 is to get as homogeneous image as you possibly can, which is why we use parallel transmit quite a lot instead of single transmit. Okay, no more questions. Can we continue, Ali, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thanks so much, Philip, for that. Great talk and, and great Q&A. Uh, we'll move on to our next uh, speakers here, um, So, uh, which is uh, Jeremy Harrington and Jad Husseini. Uh, Dr. Jerry, Jeremy Harrington is the Clinical Director of MRI and Off-Campus Imaging for the Department of Radiology at the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. And Dr. Jad Husseini is a radiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital with uh, interest in musculoskeletal imaging. And together, the two of them today will be speaking on safety considerations at 1.5T and 3T. So guys, please take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm I'm Jad Husseini. I'll I'll start by talking, and then my colleague Jeremy will 
Um, we'll continue talking uh, for the second uh, portion of the of the presentation. Um, my topic is um, uh, 1.5T and 3T implant consideration. Um, really, the, the purpose here is to uh, to focus narrowly on that particular topic uh, to try to understand um, kind of what we mean by these static magnetic fields, what their implications are on MR safety and to hopefully give you some useful information to guide your clinical practice. Um, I have to admit, um, although I have no disclosures, my, uh, my real disclosure is that I'm not a pediatric radiologist. I'm actually an adult radiologist, but in my role as the medical director of MR at MGH, um, I'm responsible, I, I'm res part of a team of uh, radiologists, uh, technologists, and physicists who help make MR safety policy and help um, address uh, individual uh, clinical situations that come up and require um, you know, our help. In this presentation, um, what we'll do is we'll talk about, uh, we'll go over some MR safety basics. We're gonna talk about the magnetic fields with a focus on the stag static magnetic field or the B0 field. Uh, someone once told me that the great, a great way to make people not listen to your presentation is to mention MRI physics. So we will try to keep the MRI physics to a minimum. I won't talk about the time-varying magnetic fields, specifically the gradients and the RF fields. Uh, there, there is a little bit of overlap between the static magnetic field and, and certain uh, concepts or safety concerns related to the RF pulse, but I'm not going to address that today. After we talk about that, we'll talk about imaging unknown foreign bodies um, at 1.5 and 3T. We'll then talk about passive and active implants at 1.5 and 3T. And lastly, um, we'll discuss the workflow that we have at MGH for screening implants and escalating certain cases to the MR safety team as needed. As I mentioned, we're only going to talk about cylindrical uh, superconductive MR scanners. This is the classic 1.5 and 3, 3T uh, donuts, so to speak. I'm not going to talk about vertical field systems or open MR magnets. There are some kind of uh, esoteric or, or um, uh, unique uh, safety considerations related to those, but uh, I think that's just beyond the scope of our, our topic today. So let's talk briefly about the static magnetic field or the B0 field. We know that at 1.5 and 3T, again, with the focus of, of our uh, topic today and even up to 7T, that the effects of the stat static magnetic field on human tissues are, are, are probably minimal and, prob and that it is probably safe. Um, the primary concern we have um, with a static magnetic field as it relates to safety is its impact uh, or its effect on implants that may be within the patient. There are really two forces that we're concerned about. One of them is a translational force or the so-called missile effect. And the other one is a rotational force or a torque force on a foreign body. The implications of course of this type of motion is that if these are present in, the, in tissue that they could injure regional tissue and they could result in some morbidity or mortality. Uh, in addition to that uh, safety component, there's also the question of uh, damaging a device, uh, an implant that's intentionally placed in a patient. And device alteration and, and damage are certainly concerns of ours. Um, and fortunately, most vendors provide guidelines for how to image those devices safely, and that's something we'll talk about. And lastly, something that I'm going to mention here and not in the rest of the presentation, I think this is something we all know quite a bit about as, uh, as radiologists, and that's that uh, foreign bodies that have a high susceptibility can result in significant artifact. And that artifact can be substantial enough that it causes uh, you know, a, a degradation of images, obscures regional structures, and can limit the utility of MR exams. So when we have this discussion about um, whether to go uh, and do an exam at 1.5T and 3T, that is also an additional consideration in addition to the, the safety considerations. Again, it, it, and needless to say, susceptibility artifact we know uh, is decreased at lower field strength magnets. So you'll see less susceptibility artifact at 1.5 than you might at 3. So as I said, the, the, uh, the interaction that we're primarily concerned about with the static magnetic field is the interaction between the static magnetic field and metal implants. Uh, a principle that's worth mentioning, again, we're going to shy away from physics as much as we can, is that the, the, the idea of susceptibility. So susceptibility, we use that term frequently to describe artifact, but susceptibility is a measure of how much a certain material will become magnetized when it's placed in the magnetic field. And there's this spectrum. Uh, negative susceptibility values are 
diamagnetic. The very, very low positive susceptibility numbers from zero to about 0 0.01 fall under the category of paramagnetic, and anything with a susceptibility greater than 0 0.1 is ferromagnetic. And really what uh, the point I want to get across is that when we're concerned about the relation, the interaction with the B0 field, we're concerned about the uh, ferromagnetic materials. Okay, so the reason I'm showing you this uh, this uh, image here, which is from Frank Shellock's MR Safety Book, is if you look under the section of paramagnetic, you'll notice some uh, recognizable metals: titanium, palladium. Right, those are materials that are relatively commonly used in certain implants. And so those, those materials are paramagnetic. So although they do have a, a positive susceptibility value, they typically don't interact a great deal with the, with the B0 magnetic field. And so the, uh, we, we'll, we'll use that information to our advantage. The other thing I wanted to bring your attention to is under the field, under the ferromagnetic section. So these are positive uh, or positive uh, susceptibility values greater than 0 0.1. You'll see that stainless steel appears in multiple places. So stainless steel is not created equal. Some are non-magnetic and some are magnetic. So um, vendors understand this and, um, and it's important for you to understand that as well when we, when we keep that in mind. So the, 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 um, the degree to which something is ferromagnetic can be quite variable. As I said, ferromagnetic uh, uh, devices or ferromagnetic implants are can be a concern because of these torque and translational forces that 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 can occur, um, and so and generally in our practice when we don't know what something is when we have a foreign body we assume it's ferromagnetic um, for the purposes of our thought experiment or the purposes of working up a patient to decide if something is safe. So let's talk about let's start with torque forces. I want to introduce you to this gradient map on the right. I don't know if you've seen these before. These come as part of the safety manual for any MRI uh, uh, scanner that you buy. In this case, this is the safety. This is the gradient map, the static gradient map for a Siemens three Tesla magnet, a Siemens Vita. And what you can imagine um, is that this is kind of a slice. So if you look at the axis where the uh, the, y, uh, the x and y axis meet at the bottom right of the graph, that's the isocenter of the magnet. And so you could imagine that along this, along the x-axis of this chart, that's where your patient would be lying. So what you're seeing in gray is the is the cutout of the bore, and then you're seeing gradient lines uh, that are being that have been placed um, that have been placed to, to illustrate what the static magnetic field that is at each of these sites. And I'm not sure if you're able to see my my mouse on these images, but what you can what you can see is that um, as you enter the bore the static field becomes stronger. So at about the, the entrance of the bore, it's, it's 1.5T. And by the time you approach isocenter, it's 3T. Now that's not surprising, right? You, you buy a 3T magnet specifically for that reason, right? The, the manufacturer guarantees you that the magnet is 3T at isocenter and for you know, 30 something, 30, 35 centimeters around isocenter, okay? Uh, the reason I'm showing you this is because the, the torque force is dependent on the strength of the static magnetic field and the shape of the ferromagnetic structure. So the static magnetic field, as we just said, is highest at isocenter. So torque forces are, are greatest at isocenter. In fact, it depends on the square of the, to of the local magnetic field. So, uh, so it's a, it's a, uh, um, those, those forces are particularly strong right at isocenter. And obviously, since the, the, the static magnetic field is greater at 3T, those torque forces will be greater at 3T. That's something to keep in mind when deciding whether to scan a patient at 1.5 or 3. Um, the shape of the, the uh, structure, the, the ferromagnetic structure, is also important. So a, an asymmetric ferromagnetic implant, let's, for example, say an aneurysm clip, will want to align with the z-axis of the field. So what you can imagine is if you place a patient into the bore, as you advance them towards isocenter, you're going to have increased torque forces pulling that linear aneurysm clip to align itself with the magnetic field. And that's why we're concerned about uh, ferromagnetic um, aneurysm clips and why we like to account for all the aneurysm clips that are placed, because the implications of one of those clips moving and dislodging uh, could be quite catastrophic. Symmetric ferromagnetic implants have negligible torque forces. There's really nothing within the structure itself to align with the magnetic field. So you can imagine a rounded structure like a BB, for example, or a ball bearing uh, will not have 
substantial or significant torque forces so that you can factor that into your decision making when you're reviewing a foreign body and deciding what forces will impact its um, will, will act on it and how it'll impact the adjacent tissues. Something that's very symmetric or very round, you should not expect to see torque forces. Translational forces, though these don't these don't de depend on the the uh, the static field. They depend on something called the spatial gradient. The spatial gradient refers to the change in the magnetic field over a distance. And so this is the same type of diagram, but instead of showing the static magnetic field, the vendor is showing you the spatial gradient. And what you'll see is that the spatial gradient or the change in the gradient over distance increases as you approach the entry of the bore so that it's at its maximum, which is illustrated here at this little site where there's an X, along the, the plastic casing of the bore right at the entry of the bore. So that's the area where you have the maximal translational forces put upon um, a ferromagnetic foreign body. And then as you approach isocenter, you have actually a very low spatial gradient. In fact, as I said before, the vendor sells you a magnet that is consistently at 3T near isocenter. And so it's not surprising then that the change in the spatial gradient over distance should be very low in that location. And so in many ways, uh, the safest place to be when it comes to translational forces is along the z-axis of your magnet, particularly near the isocenter. Uh, needless to say, um, the, the, uh, the spatial gradient uh, is uh, in, uh, there's a relationship between the spatial gradient and the uh, the static field strength of the magnet. So again, another factor that comes into design, deciding whether or not to scan a patient at 3T or at 1.5. So again, just to summarize, um, unlike torque forces, which are highest at the uh, at isocenter, translational forces are lowest near isocenter and really highest as you enter the bore. So really, so, so how do we approach 1.5 and 3T? So really, ultimately, all of these things come down to a risk-benefit analysis. And, um, and this is something we do, I would say, almost every day um, as an MR safety committee, as patients come in with these, uh, you know, uh, their, their own set of unique circumstances. So what are the factors that play into it? Well, the location of the foreign body or implant, its relation to the magnetic field, spatial gradient, um, and how those things are related to the body part imaged, right? So if you have a foreign body that's ferromagnetic that's in your toe and you're imaging uh, the, the brain um, in, a, in, a, in a young child that may be close to isocenter, but in a 17 year old, that uh, foreign body in the toe will be quite far from isocenter. And quite honestly, it'll be quite far from the entry of the bore. So the chances of having either torque forces or translational forces on it are very low. So the risk is very low and given the benefit of the MRI, let's assume it's quite high, that would be uh, an appropriate imaging study to perform. The relationship of the structure to critical, uh, the, the foreign body to critical structures. Obviously, um, the, the structures that are uh, 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 at high risk, things like the, uh, the orbits, um, brain, uh, certain visceral organs, uh, there is an increased concern that translational or torque forces might injure those structures. So the relationship of the foreign body to, the, uh, to anatomy uh, plays an important factor in the risk-benefit analysis. The, uh, the size and shape of the foreign body or implant is important too, as I mentioned before. Uh, symmetric structures, uh, rounded uh, ferromagnetic structures tend to not have torque forces. And as a result, we can kind of discount that factor um, from the, from the risk-benefit analysis. There are some, uh, to some degree, the, the how long an implant or foreign body has been present uh, impacts how much scarring and granulation tissue is around it. Um, presumably, those are uh, safer to image. In fact, some manufacturers have uh, recommendations for uh, how long to wait after a device is placed and when it can be imaged. So those are also factors to consider as well. Um, and, and then lastly, I, I said I'd men I mentioned this uh, at the beginning, and I said I wouldn't say much about it uh, as well um, afterwards, but the, the amount of susceptibility artifact that's being um, created by, uh, by a foreign body and its impact on image quality is also a consideration. As you can see here, um, in this case, there's a, a nail in, the, in this person's temporal lobe, uh, which is causing some pretty substantial uh, uh, metal artifact. There are a lot of reasons why this is an interesting uh, case from an MR safety perspective and from a clinical perspective that we don't ha uh, have time to address today. And then ultimately, the benefits become the benefits um, uh, of a 3T scan compared to a 1.5T scan. Um, there are a lot of indications where a 1.5 Tesla scan is totally sufficient and totally appropriate, and there may be ones where 3T is desirable. And that decision making uh, obviously is is kind of factored into the whole uh, risk benefit analysis. 
And of course, if there's a very high risk uh, implant or foreign body, um, the discussion of alternative imaging modalities. I know CT is, uh, you know, kind of a, a bad word in pediatric imaging, uh, but ultrasound and radiograph, uh, obviously, uh, in some cases, can provide uh, sufficient clinical uh, or diagnostic information. So we're going to do one quick um, uh, kind of test case, and we're going to go through a, a different uh, factors or variables um, to, to see if we can uh, just talk through this, because this is really what happens when we review cases as an MR safety team. This is an eight-year-old with 10 seizures per day and an EEG localizing um, to the left occipital lobe. So there's concern in this patient for a focal cortical dysplasia. And on, on the MR screening form, uh, we've, we we identify that there's a BB uh, in the left foot. And uh, just, you know, BB is a ball bearing and they're usually ferromagnetic. So this is presumed to be ferromagnetic. So what are we concerned about? Well, we're concerned about translational forces and torque forces. Not so much torque forces, I guess, because this is a BB, it's round. So pretty much we're concerned about translational forces, at least as it relates to the, to the static magnetic field. So um, in that case, do we do a 1.5 or a 3T scan? Well, in this eight-year-old, his foot's going to be sticking out of the magnet. He's going to be quite far. He's going to be, it, the foot will be along the z-axis uh, of, uh, of the uh, magnet, and it'll be relatively far from, uh, uh, it'll be in an area where there's, uh, the, the spatial gradient is relatively low. So I think in this situation, considering the value of a 3T magnet for identifying a focal cortical dysplasia, a 3T would be considered appropriate. We wouldn't have to immediately bump this down to a 1.5 just because we're concerned about, um, uh, just because we're concerned about a foreign body. What about if that same BB is in the perinephric fat? Well, so the same, the same thing is a risk benefit uh, analysis. We've kind of established the benefits of a, of a 3T magnet are, are there. So, um, you know, I think in this case, if it's in the perinephric fat, we're close to the z-axis. Um, you know, the, the spatial gradient uh, at, at that location is, um, is higher than it would be in the foot. But, uh, you know, given the importance of a 3T magnet, we could consider scanning this patient um, uh, with a BB in the perinephric fat. What about if the BB is in the sub-Q overlying the zygoma? Well, again, uh, we might be concerned about some uh, metal artifact or some susceptibility artifact from the BB. But on the other hand, a 3T magnet um, is preferable here. And if once the patient is in isocenter, the translational forces will be quite low. And so we can probably proceed. What about if that BB is in the orbit? Now that's a different story. The, um, the zygoma, overlying the zygoma, you're in the sub-Q tissues. If the BB is in the orbit, um, it, it may uh, move as the patient is being brought into the scanner and it could risk orbital structures. That would be a much more difficult discussion and we'd probably uh, ask that uh, they proceed with a 1.5T magnet. But that uh, I think is a probably a more nuanced discussion than that. I'm gonna hand things over to Jeremy who's going to take it uh, from here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I will talk about the clinical practice of uh, MR safety. So the FDA targets four areas in which our MR safety policies revolve. Um, the first being the static magnetic field and the risks related to it are translational force and torque. Uh, the radio frequency waves, uh, which um, include induced heating, uh, and that can be due to a loop or resonant heating um, of a device or an implant or proximity heating because uh, tissue is too close to the RF coils. Uh, in addition, there's gradient time varying fields could potentially, um, although the risk is low, cause induced heating. Um, and the final bullet, acoustic noise, um, not something that we'll talk about in great length, um, but we will focus on the first three bullets. So we classify MRI devices in, in three different ways. Uh, first being MR safe, the equipment can be used in any area of the room and will not interfere with imaging. These items pose no known hazard in the MRI environment through the zone four suite. MR conditional, and it's the most confused category, uh, any item that has, has been demonstrated to pose a known hazard in a specific MRI environment. And this could be related to the static magnetic field strength, the spatial gradient field, the DBDT limitations, slew rates, uh, SAR limits, um, and any other conditions that are set forth by the manufacturer. Uh, MR conditional is often confused with MRI safe, and these are two very different categories. And lastly, we have MR unsafe. It's an item that is known to post hazards in all MRI environments, and this item should never be brought into the magnet room. 
When we're looking at implant considerations, we want to classify them in two distinct ways. First, our passive implants, uh, and we're concerned about the translational force of an implant, the torque, the static magnetic field, the RF-induced heating, gradient magnetic field heating, artifacts. So if the, if the implant is within the field of view, it will it obscure the necessary anatomy that we're looking to see, as well as device damage. Same for active implants with a few more uh, bullets related to the gradient magnetic field vibration, the Lorentz forces, uh, stimulation um, and the variable stimulation over overstimulation or understimulation of a specific device, as well as a change in functionality or the damage of the device altogether. So to put it basically, passive is something that the body, something in the body that doesn't have an active, active function. Example would be an arthroplasty. Active is something in the body that has an active function, an ICD, a pacemaker, a vagal nerve stimulator, deep brain stimulator, or other neuromodular devices. In addition to the risk of the mechanical and thermal injury, there's also a risk of the device malfunctioning. The FDA requires manufacturers to test devices under certain imaging parameters. This includes the field strength, the spatial gradient strength, the slew rate, RF coil type, and the SAR limits. To the right, you can see the Lenovo VNS therapy. The, the VNS under the model numbers, there is a plethora of model numbers under the VNS. Um, so there's a divergent pathway as to how you could clear this device, this MR conditional device uh, for scanning. Um, subsequent to that, there's another divergence uh, into group A and group B, um, and that's related to the what is being scanned and what coils are being used and how long the patient can be exposed um, to, the, to the gradients. Um, so it's a quite challenging proposition in this case here for an active implant, but can be done under the right conditions. So when it comes to screening, patient and employee screening, every person must undergo MRI screening before entering zone four of the MR suite. And there are multiple screening interventions in place because we believe that no single intervention will ensure everyone and everything is safe to enter zone four. Uh, redundancy uh, prevails in these situations. So screening includes verbal and visual checks, um, signature verification from the patient, parent, or guardian uh, in the case of a pediatric. Uh, the MR screening form asks questions about medical history, surgical procedures, implanted device information, and um, information related to patches and adhesives on the skin. And this is last topic is becoming more and more relevant within the MR industry, um, particularly related to transdermal patches and um, and diet and patches for uh, di to treat diabetes and monitor diabetes. Official documentation that positively identifies the implanted device is the only accepted device that can be used for cross-referencing the manufacturer and the model numbers uh, for imaging. Many patients carry implants and identification cards. However, there's been a shift and most of the time this information is directly imported into the electronic medical record. That being said, it's still important to look for the uh, manufacturer and model and cross-reference with the manufacturer's website. We do use a safe timeout at my institution, uh, where you, and we do ask questions for anyone that's crossing zone four. And while they are screened, they are also asked if they've been trained for MRI safety, uh, and do you understand that the magnet is always on? Awareness of the staff. Has anyone who has entered the room been screened and wanded? Um, visually inspected. Visually inspect the patient staff and equipment that are cleared to enter zone four. We also concern, confirm necessary equipment entering the room is MR conditional or MR safe. Next slide. We have an escalation policy um, related to MR safety. So the technologists for routine studies will use their standard screening tools. If something is out of the norm or they have questions, they will escalate to the MR supervisor. Uh, the supervisor will decide if there is conclusive documentation. There is, they can follow the guidelines and image accordingly. If there isn't, it gets um, escalated to the local leadership team. And it's important to note that we have a number of local leadership teams across all of our hospital sites and also our off-campus sites. And the question there is, can this exam be performed in accordance with the existing policy? If yes, we follow the guidelines. If no, we image accordingly. If, if no, we engage the medical and clinical director. 
uh, to perform a risk benefit analysis and the patient can be scanned or the, if no, the patient can be canceled um, and, or, and or alternate imaging um, can be sought. We do have an MR safety committee. Um, it's a triad approach um, and it's recommended by the American College of Radiology. The MR medical director is a radiologist. MR safety officer is typically a technologist and the MR safety expert is a physicist. Our responsibilities are to develop MR safety policies for MGH and our off-campus imaging sites, um, as well as enforce those policies and procedures. As well, we perform risk we perform risk benefit analysis on specific MR requests in consultation with subspecialty MR experts. So in summary, the static magnetic field strength has important safety considerations for ferromagnetic foreign bodies and other implants. We, de we decide to proceed with an MRI based on careful consideration of the risk benefits at 1.5 and 3T. For passive implants, it's important to get the manufacturers, uh, it's important for the manufacturer to provide recommendation on parameters. And this happens most of the time, but I will caution not all of the time. Uh, and, a work, and we have a workflow for screening implants and escalating difficult cases to the MR safety leadership, which is, in help, which is helpful in ensuring safe, appropriate MR imaging across the care spectrum. Now we'll take your questions. Wonderful, Thank, thanks so much, Chad and Jeremy for that really great presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, noted here. I also see there's um, at least one person who has their hand raised. Um, if you have a question or a comment, you can use the Q&A function. Um, the button is right next to the raise hand button where you, and uh, please type it in there and we'll, we'll read it off and get it answered. Um, so hopefully while, while uh, people are putting those questions in. Um, one question that came up for Jad and Jeremy is, uh, um, how about scanning two active devices in the same patient? Um, and so, uh, you know, we're seeing DBS and VNS both in the same patient, while both may be 3T eligible. We've been scanning only in our 1.5T with a uh, transmit receive head coil with the limit set, you know, SAR less than 0.1. Um, so yeah, do either of you have comments on this? I think this is where things get really challenging, especially you have two things that are maybe both exposed to RF. Um, curious how you guys work through these. Uh, this issue does come up not infrequently. Um, I have to admit, Jeremy, you probably have more experience with these than, than I do, um, but this has been a challenge. I think we've done these on occasion, and we've worked with our physicist to um, to uh, uh, kind of address uh, concerns we have. I will say that a, a lot, most of these devices are not. Um, we are we kind of uh, leave the manufacturer guidelines the moment we have an additional device or an additional implant uh, in the patient. So it, it is a little bit of an uncharted territory. But Jeremy, you can probably speak to this better than I can. No, I agree with you, Jad. Um, this would typically be a risk benefit analysis. Uh, the manufacturers. Um, typically actually bullet out that if there's an additional device within the um, within the field um, that um, it's uh, their their guidelines are no longer valid. Um, so it would be a risk benefit analysis um, for us to to look at. And that's where the escalation um, and the safety committee, as Jad mentioned with our physicists, would come in and we would render a decision as to whether it would be appropriate to scan. Um, or would we look to seek alternate imaging? But the, in this to this specific question of a DBS and a VNS, that that has come up relatively recently, and and we I don't remember the exact parameters, but it was a like a shockingly low SAR limit um, and um, a very long exam as a result of that. Um, but yes, that is a real challenge. And the hard part about these things is we don't know. You know the manufacturers give us guidelines. Uh, we don't know the inter details of internal testing. Um, and so in many ways, you're, you're, you really, you don't know, you want to tow the line of safety, but you don't know where that line is. And, um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's where a risk benefit uh, kind of plays in, but it does make you feel like you're kind of on an island um, as, as an MR uh, you know, safety person or as a radiologist. And so these are really tough uh, questions. And I think until an institution um, has a lot of institutional experience doing these, um, it's it's really kind of hard to 
um, to deal with these uh, without dealing with them as kind of one-off situations. And that's kind of been the approach that we've taken. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's, that's yeah, I, I think to anyone who does uh, quite a bit of this, these safety assessments, that feeling of kind of be, being off on an island is, is somewhat familiar. It's something that comes up quite routinely. Um, one other comment that I'll just mention that was posted here is that challenges is that the conditions for VNS in particular um, in pediatrics, you're dealing with smaller patients than adults if using receive coils and the exclusion zone, maybe, you know, it's physically smaller in children. And we encounter this a lot as well, where they think it's a conditional, but based on the size of the child, the entire, you know, the entire child may be very close to isocenter even. Um, and so, and I think in the interest of time, we'll uh, move on to our next speaker if uh, Claudia wants to go ahead and introduce her. Okay, yes, move, move on to the next presentation. So I'm gonna introduce Diana Bardo. Dr. Diana Bardo is a pediatric neurologist and pediatric radiologist at Lurie Children's Hospital, and she is vice chair for quality and safety. She will talk about pediatric MRI safety survey, ISMRM and SPR. Thank you, Dr. Bardo. I'm having uh, trouble hearing you, Ricardo. I don't know if that's only me. I hope that's better now. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, no, okay, okay, great. Thank you so much for the kind of invitation to present this survey material for you today. Um, Dr. Cindy Rigsby, the Chair of Medical Imaging here at Ann and Robert Lurie Children's Hospital is the co-author on this paper that we recently presented to um, the SPR at the SPR meeting. And advanced, there we go. So this, we have no disclosures that are relevant and this just shows some of the um, uh, decor in our MR suite. So as we all know, and we've heard about um, in this webinar again this morning, there's lots of challenges. It's a very complex situation in ensuring MR safety in, for children and for everybody. Uh, staff and adults alike worldwide. And most patients in our environment require sedation and, and anesthesia. Um, the clinicians prefer MR anesthesia, often be combined with other procedures and surgeries, and sometimes you get that request from the patient. So it's a complex scheduling situation as well. And our children that get MRI are not simple patients. They're very complex. They have complex diseases. And many times you cannot visualize that child within the magnet bore uh, for long periods of time, which can be disconcerting to the technologists as well as to the anesthesiologist. In our freestanding children's hospital, these challenges are, you know, just the same as they are in every other place that I've worked. <laughs> Scheduling the physical facility, practices in add-on procedures, doing surgeries before or after the MRI, anesthesia care and resuscitation. Um, and so the purpose of a survey was to sort of benchmark our practices to see if we were really doing what we um, thought was the best practice, but is that what everybody else is doing or could we learn something else, et cetera. Um, and just to have exam performance and be effective and safe for the care of children in MR facilities. So we designed a 10 question email survey that was sent to the members of the Society of Pediatric Radiology MR committee, MRI committee and the quality and safety committee. And that was about 56 um, physicians. And then also 582 people in the pediatric study group of the International Society of Magnetic Residence in Medicine. Initially, uh, Cindy and I put this um, questionnaire out or a very preliminary question out to members of the SCORCH, which is the Society of Chairs of Radiology in Children's Hospitals. And there were 24 respondents at that, uh, at that time in the initial survey. Most of those patient, people are involved in these other groups as well. So we did have questions um, that I set aside because they were sort of duplicated, et cetera. So the survey question topics were about complexities in scheduling, um, MRI access, 
for hospital employees who can go in and out of the magnet area, if even if it's not just the magnet room, who can actually badge in and badge out of the of these sensitive areas. How is how is anesthesia done? How is resuscitation done, etc. And then um, what do you do about implants? Something similar in um, the concerns that we've just heard about. So the safety measures remain a premium concern all throughout across the world in pediatric MRI. The um, interesting, the survey responses indicated that MR safety is highly affected by patients with implants and screening and how that varies. MR anesthesia and combination of exams with other things like surgeries or just even something as simple as a lumbar puncture. Access to particular zones, zone two and zone three and zone four for all employees um, within the hospital or for a limited number of people and the, and the types of um, scheduling problems. So shockingly, even after that large number of, pay, of people that were asked to respond to the survey, we only had 36 responders but they did come from a broad area across the world. Many countries actually had participation. And most of those were in associated, um, university associated or academic practices. And most of them, like our practice, had three to five magnets. We have four magnets in the um, hospital inpatient area. And safety concerns, um, the big one, biggest ones were things for complex scheduling is, uh, issues and inefficiency involving the scheduling itself, anesthesia, um, working up, could somebody actually go into the magnet because they know it, we know they have an implant? And do patients arrive or efficiently and on time? Not so much at about 48%. And 50% of the patients um, often run late and are behind schedule. And the next question had to do with our, do we performed MR combination exams with a surgical procedure, et cetera? Almost everybody is, three quarters of the people are. And then sometimes when that happens, there, people are using uh, a shortened MR uh, protocol, et cetera. At Lurie, we've just really successfully ended most common, most combo MR procedures. In March of 23, we went live with reserving two um, slots for predominantly for neurosurgery to do combination exams because of GPS and localization, et cetera. Um, and then mo almost always, unless there's a really difficult airway or somebody has proven themselves to be at high risk for undergoing anesthesia or undergoing an intubation, et cetera, we, do no, we no longer do these MR and combination exams. It makes it much more efficient. The families, the physicians, and the patients, and the OR staff, the OR schedule is always messed up, and so is the MR schedule messed up. So we have mostly gotten rid of those now. The other things that we've been um, thinking about is safety measures, uh, such as um, related to those combo exams and simple procedures. So where does a simple procedure occur, like a lumbar puncture, et cetera? About 50% of people are performing those. It's actually um, in the in a procedure area prior to um, going into MRI, and that's probably what is really recommended. But we do have a lot of people that are, and us included, are doing some of those things in zone two and often in zone three because of not wanting to lose access to a groin lymph node when you're going to be doing a lymphangiogram, et cetera but it is, does take some extra setup time, et cetera, to keep, make sure ferrous objects don't end up in the uh, magnet room. And where, how about anesthesia? In uh, most situations, anesthesia is induced in zone three. Um, breath holds are performed either with the anesthesiologist in the magnet room, um, which is depending on the procedure being done to be a long time in the magnet room for the anesthesiologist or in zone three with the anesthesia machine outside of the room, which is our set current setup, and then um, tubing, et cetera, going through a waveguide to the patient. Um, I think what is going to be more important as we move forward in the future, move forward is to use navigated MR sequences more often 
and other techniques to reduce the need for breath holds. I think that would be much more ideal for kids and for the anesthesiologist and the technologist and scheduling, et cetera. And then where do you extubate, extubate patients? Mostly in zone four um, with an um, anesthesia routine in zone four. And that seems to be you know, predominantly where things are happening. Although we sort of get a mixed bag with quite a bit of action happening in zone three. And emergency resuscitation is something that I've, um, when I moved here to Lurie, um, I think we have a challenging physical setup, and I, but you know, I had a challenging physical setup in other departments as well. So I think that's probably very common. Um, and so where do you resuscitate patients? For most, most people are answering that for patient emergencies, resuscitation in, happens in zone three. Um, and the code cart and defibrillator are in zone three. So we're, you know, retooling right now and getting code carts that are um, con MR conditional that can be more securely in zone three, et cetera. Um, and in zone two, I think that would be for a general situation would be an ideal place to be doing resuscitation. It's really your physical facility will guide you and see um, where you need to be or where you could possibly be for that, et cetera. There were some concerning results here. There is 11% of people say that resuscitation for them happens in zone four in the magnet room. And when I wrote this um, survey, I included things like zone four and defined it as the magnet room. And then 6% of people said that the code cart and defibrillator are in zone four. And so I tried to define things so that we would not have any confusion about where we were talking about, but this is a very concerning result to me that people are saying that they're performing resuscitation in the magnet room um, and even performing things like defibrillation in the magnet room. We know that that can't really be true. So I think we have a lot of things that we still need to do with education and the resources of, you know, the first thing that happens when you have a patient in trouble is you have to get them out of the magnet room. And so if we're not all understanding that, I think, I don't think people are really doing this um, resuscitation in zone four. I think we might just still have some confusion about um, definitions, et cetera. Um, and part of the problem is there's not really any medical literature or society guidelines, not even from ISMRM or the ACR, the American College of Radiology, about where you should be performing resuscitation. They do say things like get the patient out of the magnet room and shut the door, but they don't get provide a lot of guidance about what is best practice in these areas. So the survey results really indicate that there's, we have lots of opportunity to um, really come together and reinforce and standardize pediatric MRI safety practices. And I think that's an excellent thing. I'm in the midst of an immersion week of advanced classes in, at Northwestern University Graduate School Program for Healthcare Quality and Patient Safety. Um, and so we were talking a couple of days ago about the implementation science, which is so you're gonna set up a best practice and how are you actually going to implement it? And they were talking about things about, you know, drugs and medical devices, et cetera. But I think this is an area that we can really get to implement implementation of MRI safety and reaching everyone so that we are, have a better safety record so that we have success in, in setting this up. So I think this is one of the papers that I'm gonna be writing over the next few weeks for the class. But um, depending on how that goes, maybe we could get together and get some of those safety practices out as well. Thank you all very much, and I'll take some questions. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Diana, for your presentation. Um, well, I think it, the, the last, the last uh, um, image was that the most important implementation of MRI safety. So, um, and for this, I think training is the key, right? Because 
uh, when, uh, I mean, we work with in an MRI area, we work, we do a lot of time, uh, all days MRI scans, but I'm not sure if we are really aware or we take a lot of care about this concept, right? MRI safety. Right. And uh, for sure, uh, many places uh, don't have like protocols or checklists, may maybe even they don't have checklists. So it's really important just to work in the in the in the with a huge community with a lot of hospital and and institutions, just to be sure that they are following like certain rules, right? A certain uh, uh, a correct protocol just to maintain safe patients, also the the machines and um, the uh, personnel in the in these areas. So, well, I want to uh, tell you thanks a lot. I don't know if there is a question. I think there is one question. Yeah, I have one here in the yes. system. And I, I, see a couple of, I see a couple of people with their hand raised, just a reminder that please enter your questions through the Q&A system and then we can read them off. Uh, this question, um, Dr. Bardo, uh, is um, uh, for babies that need MRI, uh, do you do feed and swaddle type techniques? We do. We often do try that. Um, it's not always successful, as you probably have, have um, experienced yourself, but that is really, you know, less than three months old. We really do try to um, implement that as a choice. Um, we do have some protocols that are a little bit shortened for that situation that are appropriately for, you know, for the spine or maybe for shorter brain protocols for that situation. So, but I think it's a great technique. Yeah, thank you. D Diana, I had a, a question about a comment that you had on one of the slides, which was uh, about these uh, combo coordinated MRI plus something else cases, which I think many of us uh, suffer from on a daily basis. And I saw that <laughs> you guys had eliminated. Can you just talk a little bit more about what your experience has been since you've gotten rid of them? You know, I think there's there's often so much pushback about you have to anesthetize a kid twice. Um, just curious to hear your experience with it. Yeah, we actually set up a committee to work through this with um, surgery and anesthesia and uh, radiologists and the scheduling uh, folks to be able to work through this quite a bit. And it was really uh, led by the surgical uh, suite uh, and the surgeons because they would be holding an, uh, an OR room open, waiting for the child to come down to uh, or get, get the kid out of MRI to them or vice versa. We would be holding a magnet open. And really we have so much, we, we have a backlog of patients that we're trying to get in for, to both areas, into the OR, and into um, MRI. And if we could cut out all of that wasted time waiting for a patient to come back and forth, then we would be able to maybe scan two or three more patients a day or perform another couple OR um, cases per day. And the families don't like it either. We would get, you know, oh, you said my kid was gonna have their MRI at noon and now we're waiting for the OR so it's not gonna start until 5 p.m and the child's NPO all of this time. And it, it, was, not, it was not a good experience for anyone. Um, we set up a uh, forms sort of uh, paper that said, okay, if you really feel like you need to have an, an uh, the first answer was, no, you're not gonna get the combination exam. If for some reason you really believe that the child needed to have that, then you had to you know, justify it somewhere, somehow. And, um, we're following up those forms and those, et cetera. I don't have any idea what the um, true numbers are. Anecdotally, I think maybe less than a third of them get through as a combination exam. Now I could probably find that data. And in fact, I probably will in the next few weeks. The other thing is that it's, um, it's just safer for the patient to go ahead and get two anesthetics. There's really used to be some literature out there um, but that's now been rethought out that it really does not uh, raise more concern or more safety risk to do a second anesthesia in most kids. Um, and I think that we need to maybe remind, remind ourselves of and remind everybody else of that better literature 
that shows that it's not a, a, wor a greater risk in safety. Thank you. Yeah, I've often wondered, at least at uh, Stanford Children's, you know, I feel like we do the exams, uh, we still have our combination exams, but I think we often end up prolonging the time under anesthesia by doing those because like you said, you finish a scan, now you're wait, you might wait for an OR, you finish the OR, and even if the magnet's already open, you have this transport time, depending on how far apart they are. I've often wondered if it, it, it's, it's even counterproductive to do, so <laughs> very curious. I think very that, was, that, that you guys have done this, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it'll be worth um, presenting at a couple of, you know, maybe a surgical, uh, situation and a radiology situation and, and like a me society meeting or something and really starting that conversation again because I think it's better for the child in most cases not to do that. Now the cases that we have that are that are do we go ahead and get um, scheduled are kids with you know a, a cruzon or other mid-base hypoplasia that are a difficult um, intubation. Um, kids that have been shown themselves with that you know undergoing an intubation and an anesthetic has been troublesome in the past. And we do let those kind of cases go through. Thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Bardo for a few more minutes. So if anyone wants to put things into the Q&A, um, please do so. One, one question that I have, and this is um, for, for you, Diana, and really anyone, anyone else who's been uh, in this conversation today, I think one of the challenges that we have increasingly come across in, in just the sort of pediatric safety um, realm is the increasing number of devices in the U.S. that just have no MR te testing done, particularly passive implants that just say they haven't done any testing, you're on your own. Um, and, it, and it's often, I think, quite challenging in those situations to even figure out what the real risk is. Um, and I think they, they you know, as, uh, as, as Jad mentioned, we lean heavily on these escalation pathways and then these sort of discussions that um, often feel like we have very limited information. Um, do, is this something that you've also noticed in your practice, this sort of increasing number of, of passive implants in particular that have been unlabeled? Yes, absolutely. And I, we recently had our vascular access team wanted to switch to a different type of IV because they didn't want to have that backflow of blood coming at them and, a, and a exposure risk. And I completely understand that. I was a phlebotomist for a bit before going to medical school. And it, you, I do understand that. But they chose a a device that had a little metal spring in it, which is what, how the backflow didn't happen. Um, but they didn't tell anybody that, or I, well, I'm sure they told people, they, had, they told the people on the device team that approves things for the, um, for the house, et cetera, but there was no radiologist or MR physicist or anybody on that team. So one of the, our anesthesiologists who um, very astutely asked, is this MRI safe? Because she works in MRI every day. And they got that she got the question, the answer back that no, it's MR conditional. This makes the point that I believe Jeremy made earlier, um, or his co-presenter made, that conditional, MR conditional is a completely different category from MR safe. And so this IV catheter was MR conditional, and the condition was that it could cause artifact. And so if you had an arm that you were examining under MRI, you might have a great big um, art, you know, area of artifact that would obscure anatomy, et cetera, with this device. And so for many reasons, we were able to um, get them to rescind that decision and go back to the original um, standard um, IV catheter. And at the same time, and I think this is an important point I wanted to make today, if you're not on it, or if another radiologist or your MR physicist is not on it, get yourself a seat at the table um, for the discussions about what comes into the hospital and is used and are implanted in patients. Because this can make a huge difference, particularly in a child. We're working on, with our surgeons right now, and I forget what the name of the device is. Oh, it's a mantis clip. It 
helps close a large defect in the bowel, but it's also about 11 to 20 centimeters worth of black artifact, just void in your image if you have paramagnetic artifacts because you are, have this thing in your abdomen. And if you can imagine that being in a newborn, that's gonna you know, make them nearly completely impossible to image their abdomen if that's something that's needed while this thing is in place. So get yourself a seat at the table on these committees. It's extra work, but it's well worth it. Thank you. Chad, Jeremy, Claudia, Mary, have you guys also had this sort of, uh, Philippa, have you guys also had this sort of problem of increasing number of implants? It's come to the point for us where we have implants that are commonly used that we've resorted to doing lab style testing ourselves to create internal guidelines. And so um, just curious what, what other people are doing uh, to try and work through a lot of these unlabeled implants that are seeming to pop up. Um, well, I work on 7T, so nothing tested at 7T. So um, we're currently going through our in own in-house testing for dental wires for, brace, for braces and also uh, dog bone clips from craniotomies and contraceptive devices. And that's quite the same across the 7T network across the whole. But for the lesser field strengths, um, we have quite stringent um, SOPs in place and if anything isn't included in that our physics team do off-label risk assessments where they research what the risks might be against the benefits of the scanning and we also have quite a widely accepted um, system in place that if it's for clinical reasons we will go down that route but if it's for research and it's not going to change that patient's management then we won't go down that route of doing an off-label risk assessment for the research purposes. Equally, we have it at the other end of the spectrum as well, where we have our 0.55 Tesla. Again, there's nothing really tested at that strength. So we kind of have it at the other end of the 7T. So I think we're quite a unique centre, but, you know, it's kind of, it is interesting to kind of sit there and think actually, you know, most test things are tested at 1.5 and 3T. And actually there's lots more field strengths out there and actually lots more interesting and wild and wonderful implants that are coming out and everyone's coming out with lots of things and multiple implants as well. So, and as people are living longer as well. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. Okay, we'll just check, we can check the Q&A one more time. Claudia, do you have any other questions that you've come across? I think we can finish, Ellie. No All right. Questions. Well, I don't. I don't think we have any more questions. I want to thank um, all of the speakers from the World Federation of Pediatric Imaging and the ISMRM for really great presentations. I want to thank all the attendees also for the great questions and comments, um, and then all of the organizers. Um, particular thanks to uh, Mary Louise Greer and really everyone from World Federation and from ISMRM who's done a great job organizing this panel. Um, I believe this has been recorded and will go online and the part one similarly uh, was recorded as well. And hopefully we'll have many more of these in the future. So thanks so much, everyone. Thanks everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye.